Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 553. And today, Andrew and I are talking about guns. It's going to be a, probably an intense conversation. And the first thing to let you know is that we're actually recording this one in video, something we've been talking about, and we figured we'd give it a shot. So if you're listening to this in the podcast feed, know that there is a video version on YouTube that you can check out. Where else can you check things out related to Whistlekick? Well, you can go to whistlekick.com. You can see all the things that we make. You can see all the things that we do. They're featured in the in the navigation menus. They're all over the place. But Martial Arts Radio gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And we give you two new episodes every week, all kinds of good stuff, interviews and discussion and things to make you think. Things to make you go, hmm, which is kind of the goal because we're trying to get you to think. We're trying to supplement your martial arts training with some martial arts thinking. Now, if you value what we do, you got some ways you can help out. You can share episodes, follow us on social media. You can do all that normal stuff. You can leave us reviews, but you could also contribute to the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. That's the place to go for that. And if you do, we're going to give you even more great content. So without further ado, Andrew, thanks for for coming on and uh, shining your your head. Uh, I think that spotlight is uh, shared by the both of us, Jeremy. (laughs) It it is. It absolutely is. I cut my hair this morning, and I don't think there's ever been more glare on a podcast than unfortunately that may be true. And and this is after we made yeah, things better. True. <laughs> Moved cameras it, it, around, it, it, changed <laughs> lighting. Oh man, man, there, there's a. Uh, I just have to shine. I take solace in the fact that I save a lot of money on shampoo. That's all. I had one yep. bottle through college. Yeah, and that's something that people just they, they don't even think. Wait, you don't have to buy shampoo or a conditioner, or combs or hairbrushes. I've had people ask me, "Do you have a hairbrush?" Yeah, I've had that. I've had that too. I, I used no, to. I don't. <laughs> yeah, when I was like 10 and I had hair, I started cutting my hair when I was 12. We could probably make a really boring episode about our mutual uh, lack of locks, but that's not why people are here. People are here for us to talk about martial arts. And of course, with a, a, a subject like guns, doesn't necessarily feel like a martial arts topic. No, and that's uh, that'll be interesting to see how it's received. But I think the first thing we need to talk about is that we are not here to discuss the legality of guns, whether guns should right. or shouldn't exist. We are prefacing this whole episode on the fact that guns do exist. They are in our society and in some societies more than others. I suspect if you're in Canada or the UK, it's not as much of a concern for you. Um, but they do exist. So this episode mm-hmm. isn't to discuss whether they should. We know that they do. Right. Right. This is there's we are not here to discuss the politics. We are not here to discuss the ethics. We are here to discuss the realities, because as martial artists, we deal with what we have in front of us. And most of the time we're training and what's in front of us is a fist or a foot. And the consequences of getting it wrong aren't terribly severe. You know, it might be a broken nose or a black eye or maybe even just a little bit of blood. Mm-hmm. But the consequences of getting a gun wrong are far more significant. Yeah, it can be fatal for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, we within the karate world, you know, we train often in kobudo, which is essentially just working with weapons. And we right. often see the quote unquote I can do this because we're on video. The typical <laughs> weapons of the katana, the nunchaku, or kama, or sai, or tonfa, or the bow, which is the most common, right, used in most right. most styles. And we always see kata evolved around using those weapons, you know, or sometimes even sure. taking an empty hand form and just putting in weapons in your hand. Yeah. Um, and we don't see kata for guns and so Mm. the first question was well why and the answer is fairly straightforward they didn't have they weren't they weren't as prevalent i mean guns existed sure um, but well it depends on how far back you're going and and where you're deciding the roots of forms to be if we're talking you know the 40s or the 50s you know, 1940s, 1950s. Yeah, absolutely. They had firearms yeah. back then. And we probably have somebody watching or listening saying, you know, well, the Chinese invented gunpowder. And you know, well, 
but they weren't as prevalent. If it was right, if it was a major concern, then ancient, you know, Chinese martial arts would have incorporated it in a way that probably would have survived. It either didn't happen or it didn't survive. Regardless, it's a now problem. Absolutely. It wasn't a then problem, but it is a now problem. So the question then lies, if you were to create a gun kata, and I'm excluding the gun kata from the movie Equilibrium, which we could discuss <laughs> in a second, but um, you know, most kata typically show how to use that weapon as an attacker. You know, you might block or, you know, receive some sort of a strike and then attack with it. So what would a gun kata look like if you were to have one? Sure. Sure. Well, what's the purpose? Of, and, and you know, you're you're free to keep using the term kata. I'm going to use the word form, <laughs> sure, form, you know, because because, we you know, we've got we've got people from from all sorts of styles, you know, not not just Japanese martial arts that are that are watching or listening. And what's the purpose? The purpose of a form is. It's to practice movements. It's to build comfort. If we think about the the application side of it, it's to build comfort in the techniques such that you can apply them when needed with less, um, let's say, less stress mm -hmm. involved. Oh, I need to do these three movements. Somebody's throwing a front kick at me. I'm going to low block reverse punch, right? I mean, that's, that's a, a pretty common set that might happen. And while it might not be the most directly applicable situation or, or, or combination to the situation, I mean, it still works, right? That's, that's where forms come in. So if we're talking about a firearm, I think it's a big difference. Are we talking about utilizing one to attack or utilizing or, or defending against one? Most forms start off defensively and end, at least all the ones I ever learned, started and ended defensively. Because in theory, you're not starting a fight, right? <laughs> sure. You're, you're uh, being confronted, victorious, and cautious at the end. But does that still hold up if we're talking about firearms? Yeah, most, most forms will be... Uh, most empty hand forms are not start to finish. This is how you defend against a bow. You know, you, you you may have a particular move that would work against a bow, but it's not designed necessarily to be that way. And so I'm wondering, Jeremy, do you think there are any gun forms today? I'm sure somebody's developed something. I think there's I think there's more than you think. Really? I do. And and. I'm wondering if this is one of those things that doesn't get discussed. I think it's one of those things where I'm using the word form a slightly more mm -hmm. expanded view than some might say. I would okay. make an argument that if you're in the military, you learn how to strip down and put together your gun in a way mm. that no one else does. And you always do it the same way. It's always done methodically with precision so one could make the argument that if you're in the military or some sort of paramilitary organization that, that uses firearms, you may have a kata that you have designed yourself to put together and disassemble your, disassemble your gun. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The question then becomes, I guess, what is and what isn't the form that we're talking about? You know, if we're talking about a gun form, right, that is absolutely a form. There are, if we think about uh, most Tai Chi, the, if we think about Tai Chi the way most people are practicing it, they are, even though there are combative elements to it, they are not, the, their intent is not to practice combative elements. I know plenty of people who practice Tai Chi forms and the combative aspects are mm -hmm. completely lost on them. And so you could make an argument that a form a pattern, a sequence, a dance can occur with a firearm in a lot of different ways, just as it could. Or a military drill hits. team. I mean, that's mm. the first one. That, that's the first one that mm, jumped to mind to me. Yeah. Is that the, 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 I had the pleasure of seeing uh, a U.S. military drill team last year at the Edinburgh Military Tattoo. Unreal. The precision that they are using to maneuver their weapons. Can, can you describe so, what you saw a little bit? Uh, they were all rifles with bayonets uh, on the end. 
uh, and there were probably 20, I'm guesstimating about 20 or so members of the team that moved in sequence uh, different maneuvers with their rifle. Um, often they mm. were they just held their own rifle, but there were some times where they would uh, face each other, square off maybe 10 on one side and 10 on the other, and they would be tossing their rifles with bayonets, <clears throat> tossing them to each other back and forth. Um, absolutely. That shows precision. Nope. You're not while, getting that one wrong. <laughs> uh, and while they're tossing them back and forth, essentially forming a tunnel, they would have a member walk, uh, march, you know, very precisely between wow. the rows and because they started on one side and just waved essentially waved it down to the other side this person walked through without any assuming without any fear of getting hurt that for sure i would consider a form i would agree i mean what is it what is it training it's training comfort with the weapon knowing where your hands are they have to be in the exact same place every time otherwise the catch or the throw might not work or worse yet your bayonet catches the person walking through the line i mean that's yeah that yep. definitely sounds like um, a form. and you can search this on youtube they're pretty they're pretty easy to find just type, look up for the mm. like the u.s marine drill team um and you'll find them it's it's pretty amazing but there are other things to consider as well that could it be uh clearing a building you know learning how to methodically go through and clear a building or even getting more to the quote self-defense or self-protection side um, many schools now have active shooter drills that the school does. The whole school, yeah. th if there is an active shooter in the school, this is what you do. Um, and I think an argument can be made that that is also a type of form. You are doing it. And this now ties directly into self-defense and self-protection, that this is what you're doing to stay safe. Yeah, there, there are plenty of ways that we can look at a firearm and think about it from a self-defense perspective, um, you know, and not just the obvious ones. You know, I remember one time going shooting with my father and his, the, the webbing in his thumb was a little bit too close to the slide and it came back it and him. it, yep. it cut him. It, it bit him and he probably should have had stitches. He didn't. But if you talk to a lot of people, a lot of them have a, a story about a, a handgun with somebody's, you know, hand webbing getting caught under the slide. It's a pretty common thing for sure. It is. And if you talk to somebody who practices nunchaku, just about everybody's got a story of cracking Many themselves times. in the head. <laughs> Mostly as a kid, <laughs> but for sure. I've, I've, I've put myself down yep. on the floor. Yep. So, now the reality is us in society, we are more likely to encounter a handgun than we are any other type of gun in, in a, in, in a self-protection type scenario. Um, sure, not that, not that other guns don't exist and not that other guns aren't used in, in that type of way. But I think statistically you're going to find handguns are more typically what you'd find. Because they're concealable. If you're using a handgun on someone, it's probably not for legal mm -hmm. purposes. If, if someone is initiating an attack on you, and or on anyone, if someone is initiating an attack, utilizing a handgun, and they are not law enforcement or military, uh, it's a, a incredibly high statistical probability that they are doing something illegal. So they're going to want to conceal that weapon, a shotgun, a rifle. Yeah, a little absolutely. Bit harder to conceal. And by a little <laughs> sure. bit, I mean a lot. So, all right, everybody, we're back. I want to apologize. My computer crashed it just completely died in the middle of talking to andrew i got this crazy blue screen and went you're done and instead of burning the time to figure out what's going on there uh we decided that we would just swap over to my laptop so the audio might be a little different the video is probably a little bit different it's definitely a different angle but we'll we'll keep going so andrew <laughs> my apologies to you as well uh, technology can can be a pain. I mean, this is the tough side of running a technology business. Sad right? but true. Yeah. Uh, where were we? We were. <laughs> I completely forgot due, okay. to, due to the stress over watching the That's meltdown. All right, Jeremy. So we were discussing, we had swapped into talking about handguns. Uh, only what 
was actually called Gun Kata from the movie, the 2002 movie Equilibrium. I, I don't suppose you've seen that movie. I haven't. Now, you, as we were talking about the notes for this episode, you mentioned it, and I had on my list. I was hoping to to watch it over the weekend. It didn't happen. But uh, for for those of us, myself included, who haven't seen the film, could you give us some, you know, the relevant part of what you're talking about there? Sure. So it was a 2002 movie with uh, Christian of recorded gunfights. The clerics, which were the peacekeepers at the time, have determined that the geometric distribution of antagonists in any gun battle is a statistically predictable element. The gun kata treats the gun as a total weapon, each fluid position representing a maximum kill zone, inflicting maximum damage on the maximum number of opponents, while keeping the defender clear of the statistically traditional trajectories of fire. By the rote mastery of this art, your firing efficiency will rise by no less than 120%. The difference of a 63% increase to lethal proficiency makes the master of the gun katas an adversary not to be taken lightly. Wow. Yeah. And it, very interesting and not very realistic, but it, it was <laughs> it was it was fun to watch and and I'll describe what their gun katas were. Um, the kata was, or the form was someone with two pistols. And if you were to picture someone, and I can do this cause we're on video, like voguing, like, uh-huh. you know, the Madonna, like, yeah. You know, and they would like do a move and stand in a particular way with both of their pistols facing one way and then sh- shift to another position. And mm. it, it very much looked like an actual form that you would, perform at a at a tournament you know or, or have in, in some sort mm. of martial arts school they just happen to have two pistols in their hand and it it visually it was really cool to watch um the movie was not as bad as you might think but i don't know that i would say it was a great <laughs> movie sure um but you know thinking of that led me into thinking should we and this is a question for you jeremy what are your thoughts on martial arts schools up up, up until now we've been discussing kind of fun frivolous like you know is a drill team a, sure. a, a gun kata but what are your thoughts on martial arts schools actually teaching defense against how to disarm someone with a gun it is such a mixed bag right If we think about the role of a martial arts school, what is the job? The job of a martial arts school can vary depending on the instructor and how they see their role and the students that that attracts. Some schools are primarily about self-defense. Some schools are about personal growth. I'm going to make the claim that the majority of schools are a majority of personal growth. That. And, and you can see that in the curriculum, right? Most schools don't spend all their time drilling self-defense. So we can we can kind of take that take that out in a sense and say that for most martial arts schools, firearms are not going to be a uh, a mandatory component of the curriculum. And if they do enter the curriculum, it's a not even a secondary aspect. It's tertiary. It's below that. It's uh, almost an afterthought. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you've got other schools that are really working to prepare people for real world self-defense. Um, you know, whether that is the majority or e- even a component, you know, I know some traditional martial arts schools who are very traditional, teach traditional forms, a lot of very traditional things, but when it comes to their self-defense curriculum, they take it very seriously. And firearms need to be part of that conversation. But here's the challenge. Here's the issue with firearms versus every other method of train of, of not method, every other aspect of self-defense. You and I can get to a very realistic level training hand to hand, you know, non-weapon self-defense. The worst thing that happens is I kick you in the head or I punch you in the face or something, right? The, the consequences of getting it wrong, and let's face it, when you're training, when you're learning something, you're going to get it wrong more than you get it right. That, those consequences are, are minimal in the grand scheme. You know, the worst thing that's going to happen is you have a broken nose or 
you know, you're really mad at me. We're no longer friends. These mm-hmm. might not be great things, but what happens when we consider that same perspective with firearms? You die. Big difference. Horrendously big difference. Now, there are some absolutely wonderful tools out there. I know a little bit about firearms. I'm far from an expert. I do not shoot as often as I would like to. I own and I will not even say I train with, but I do own firearms. There are some some great tools out there. Most of us are familiar with the, you know, the 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 orange rubber handgun that shows up in a lot of self-defense curriculums in, in traditional martial arts schools because it mimics the the dimensions and the weight mm-hmm. with virtually no risk. I mean, the, the most risky thing is that it falls on your toe. And yep. many of us have had that happen and it hurts. But again, you don't die. There are also other tools. Um you know, you, you could you could think of things like airsoft or paintball or there are laser driven items that get a little bit closer. There's a projectile. Maybe it's one that you feel, maybe it's one that you see. So you can get you can get closer there, but you're still not there. It's still not the real thing. It's still not the equivalent of we're doing bow 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 sparring or you know, stick unarmed self-defense and oh, you miss or maybe you don't get it quite right and now your arm's bruised. Or uh, again, I've smacked the stick off the top of your head because you didn't block, get out of the way, whatever, and I did my part wrong. Or, or maybe I did my part right, right? <laughs> but I can live with exactly, that. Exactly, literally. And mm-hmm. so the other side of guns there, how do we do that? How do we get close enough to that realism to say this is going to work? Because here's the thing. In my experience, I have trained in a number of schools that have firearms as part of the self-defense curriculum, not using them, but defending against them. And most of the time, most of the people would die. Now, if you look at it that way and you say, you know what? Any level of knowledge is better than no level of knowledge. And I'd rather have a 85% chance of dying being attacked by a handgun than a 100% chance. I would say, you're right. I'm, I'm there with you. I'll take 99 mm-hmm. over 100 any day. Right? It's, it's, it gives me a little bit more chance of living. But where I think the problem is, and I think whenever anybody talks about the issues with self-defense, this is the heart of it. False sense of security. False confidence. I feel because I've done these drills in my school for, let's not even take a small period of time. Let's say you're, you've been training for 20 years and you have had some handgun training and now you think, okay, I just need to do what I I've been taught. And a situation where I was unlikely to be shot now turns into one where I get shot. That's the concern. Would you agree? Absolutely. I think training how to disarm someone with a gun, we run a huge risk of giving people self-confidence to be able to disarm someone when in fact they may very well get killed. And I think that's, I think we would be doing our students a disservice to do that. I I remember when I was in high school, my first instructor, um, Sensei Treem, he had a great class that impacted me, but with one st- statement that was amazing. He got up in front of the class and he had one of the, the top students grab a, a, a tonfa and grab it like a club. And he said, this is a technique you can do against a club. And he did something. And he had that student get a knife. And he said, this is a technique that you could do against a knife. And he did something. And then he had the student pr- pretend to have a gun and said, this is the only technique you should do when someone approaches you with a gun. And he reaches in his back pocket and pulls out his wallet and then hands it over. Every time we see self-defense with a gun, it is predicated on one very simple uh mistake that the attacker makes do you know what that is they get within range they would get Mm -hmm. within arm's length of the person they are attacking i have no idea i'm not a criminal i've never robbed anyone 
I don't hang out with criminals or people who rob people. So I have no idea how often that's going to happen. But I do know, I shouldn't say I know, I suspect that people who are well-trained in firearms know you don't do that. You don't get within, you, you don't give up the advantage. The advantage of a firearm is that I can kill you from here when you're there. From yeah, a distance. I, I, you're 10 feet away. You can't do anything to me without a handgun. I'm, I'm good to go here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Even let's say five feet, you know, as long as you're outside of hand distance. And this is where I think it becomes really problematic is that what happens when I'm trying to mug you and I'm just out of arm's reach? And you, and you train there, right? I mean, we get, because we, we all have to do, we do the hands up thing because they're closer to the gun and yep. it's the defensive posture. And now all of a sudden I can react faster than you. I can, I can act faster than you can react. And that gives me a chance. But now the gun's just outside of that. I, I don't know what to do. Do I panic and lunge for the gun and get myself killed? And this is what I don't know about the variety of curriculums out there. Are they teaching, hey, when this scenario that I would suggest is statistically more likely to happen, and I'm happy to be corrected by someone, that it's outside of arm's length, do you train? Here's what you do. Here's how you recognize where you have a chance and don't. Here's how you read the attacker to know there's a good chance that you're just going to get away. You're going to get off with just losing your wallet versus your life. What do you think? Uh, I, I would agree. I, I, and I think some people will make – some people may make the argument – that you stated at the beginning that we should be training on how to defend against a gun. And, and if someone's mugging you and they're far away, you should run at them because at least then you have a slight chance to disarm them. Whereas you can't, if you're far away, but you also can't, you have no idea by looking at your opponent necessarily that handing over your wallet will still result in your death. Right. That, you know, you, you are far more likely to still be able to survive the encounter by just doing what you're, to what you're asked to do than you are by rushing someone with a gun. I think a lot of us are desensitized a bit with regard to violence and firearms because of television and movies. We assume mm -hmm. that most people who pull a gun are comfortable taking your life. I don't think that is true. Again, not my area of expertise. And, and you know, I think it's important for listeners and viewers to know now that Andrew and I are having this conversation, not because we are experts in this, but because it's a conversation that, like everything else we do on Martial Arts Radio, it's meant to make you think. It's meant to make you say, hmm, how should this go? Maybe you have a conversation with your instructor. Maybe you are an instructor and you realize maybe I'm not doing a great job conveying this information to my students, or maybe you're knocking it out of the park and there are other people that you should help do that with and for because the majority of martial arts schools, I think, do a great job of many, many things. Handling the conversation around firearms is not one of them. I, I would agree. I think the only caveat I would add is, um, and this wasn't a seminar that I went to, but there's a, a female black belt in the school that I train in who has gone to um, crisis mm -hmm. prevention seminars. And one of the things that she has been told m multiple times is that uh, you don't necessarily want to fight back unless they're asked to take you somewhere else. If someone is trying to abduct you and put you in a car to bring you someplace else, then you absolutely need to fight. That's what I've heard. I'm not. This is not me stating you need it to do this. It's also what I have heard. Statistically, um, that, that you know, statistically speaking, you are way better off fighting than you are if someone is trying to, let's say, put you in a trunk and and bring you someplace else. But outside of that, I, I, in my opinion, the only true defense is to. Uh, comply with what you're being asked to do give up your wallet um give them your watch or whatever it is uh and then run away as quickly as possible there there's a a great scene in one of my favorite movies based on one of my favorite books 
the way of the peaceful warrior where the two main characters are mugged by three guys and not only do they give over their wallets but one of the characters uh, the the older one says to the younger one you know give him your watch they didn't even ask for his watch mm. and it by the end of the scene the two are walking away in their underwear they've given up their shoes their pants everything and it's not quite the lesson that they're trying to teach in that movie but my takeaway was i'd rather be down i'd rather be embarrassed and walking down the street naked than shot and i don't just mean shot to death i mean shot at all i'll, I'll take sure. walking down the street naked to getting shot in the calf there, there's yep. there's nothing I, I would imagine there's nothing pleasant about that i've never heard anyone describe being shot and say you know it wasn't that bad <laughs> Yeah, I would. A good point. Absolutely. So we've, we've raised a lot of questions. Do we have any concrete, definitive information for people? I, I don't think so. I think my goal in bringing this topic up, which I knew right away that it was going to be potentially very controversial, as you mentioned already, it's just to get people to think. We don't Neither of us, I think, and I think I can speak for you in this. Neither of us came into this expecting we know everything. We know, we know anything I mean, for me. Being I know everything. I don't, I don't know anything. <laughs> um, but it is a topic that I think does warrant some at least thought yeah. and some dis potential discussion um, with your instructor if they, if, you know, if they potentially are teaching this sort of stuff. Like, what is the end goal? Like, what is realistically should should happen in this type of scenario? Yeah. I, I would say that there, there needs to be some more context for most of the schools based on what I have seen. Okay, we're going to go over gun defense. Okay. When do you apply gun defense? When don't you? For people who are theoretically competent at that, are they willing to stand in front of a paintball gun? If you can't, handle that. And I would imagine most people's anxiety is going to spike through the roof and they're going to slow down. And there's sure. a good chance that it doesn't work out well. If you can't defend against that, then you probably shouldn't be defending against an actual gun. There should be some progression, just like everything else we do in martial arts. <laughs> All right. Anything else we should add? No, I think that covers it. If anybody has feedback, you know, the, the, the best thing to do of course, is to comment on the blog section, you know, under this episode. What did we say this was? 553? Yeah, 553 at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You know, love to hear what you say. If if you've got something you want to share a little more privately, you can email me at jeremy at whistlekick.com. I'll share it with Andrew. and We can go from there. So I mentioned that website, whistlekick.com. If you want to support what we do, you can buy something there. Uh, you can join the Patreon. You could tell people about an episode. Um, you know, if check out what we do, we do a lot of, a lot of stuff trying to help the martial arts world, help get people to ask questions and answer them and, and all that. So, uh, that's all I've got, Andrew. I'm great. Right. Well, until next time, train hard and smile and have a great, have day. a great day. Have a great day.